So I'm truly thrilled today to introduce our speaker. Jonathan Ebert is associate, soon to be full professor of comparative literature, English, and French and Francophone studies here at Penn State. For those of you who have the pleasure of being a colleague or a student of Jonathan's, you already know the enthusiasm, curiosity, and intellectual veracity that he brings to all of his endeavors. He's been an indispensable member of this department since 2005, and we're really thrilled to have him speak today. Jonathan is the founder and the acting president of the ISSS, the International Society for the Study of Surrealism, the president of the Association for the Study of Dada and Surrealism, and the former president of ASAP, the Association for the Study of the Arts of the Present from 2014 and 2015. He's editor-in-chief and the founding co-editor of the journal ASAP. Published by John Hopkins University Press, this journal has literally won all of the awards. <laughs> this includes the Council for Editors of Learned Journals, the CL CELJ 2017 Award for Best Design, the 2018 Award for Best New Journal, and the Association of American Publishers 2019 Prose Award for Best New Journal in the Humanities. This is truly an amazing feat. Jonathan's teaching and scholarly interests include international avant-garde movements, 20th and 21st century literature and the arts, as well as literature and cultural theory. He's the author of the book Surrealism and the Art of Crime from Cornell University Press in 20, uh, 2008, and Outsider Theory, which we'll be speaking about today, Intellectual Histories of Unorthodox Ideas from the University of Minnesota Press in 2018. He has published dozens of articles in a range of academic journals from Critical Philosophies of Race to the PMLA to Modern Fiction Studies. <coughs> Trust me, if I read the, the entire list, you're just going to feel bad about yourself. <laughs> Jonathan co-edited four additional books, the year's works in Nerds, Wonks, and Neocons with Benjamin Trier, Indiana University Press 2017, Lenora Carrington and the International Avant-Garde with Katrina uh, McCara from Manchester University Press in 2017. The year's work in the Oddball Archive with Ruta, Judith Roof from Indiana University Press in 2016. And Paris Modern Fiction and the Black Atlantic with Jeremy Braddock for Johns Hopkins University Press in 2013. He also edited or co-edited special issues of Modern Fiction Studies, New Literary History, and the African American Review, Comparative Literature Studies, Criticism, and ASAP. Finally, Jonathan is a series editor of the Reconfiguring Modernism book series at Penn State University Press. Please welcome me in welcoming Jonathan. Uh, thanks so much for coming, and I can thank doubly um, my class that's here during this time slot, uh, your captive audience, so thank you doubly. Um, if anybody needs to leave at 110 based on class periods, of course, I shall be deeply offended and, you know, scarred, but you, you may do so anyway. Uh, let's see. Okay, so, <laughs> once again, greetings to the students. I, I always tell my students, I uh, urge them, I would say, to avoid uh, cliches and truisms at the beginning of a presentation. This is kind of an injunction that I'm about to break. So this book here that you can see, and I have the hardback version here, it's only $120 in hardback, but a bargain <laughs> in paperback at $29.95 for full price, but I think Amazon discounted it to zero. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so this is not the book itself, this is a picture of the, of the cover and a picture of the contents, just lest we get confused. <laughs> Why you would pay for that is beyond me. Uh, so I'm beginning with the truism that one should never believe anything one reads. In a sense, this is what my book is addressing. Uh, how truthy is this truism? There's a lot to be said about the claims it makes. How much, for, every, for instance, is the everything that one might read? If you're not going to believe everything you read, what is the everything? Who exactly is the one who reads? And who is the one who believes? Are they one and the same? What does reading even mean? Does it refer to turning the pages of a book, or swiping down the screen, or to the work of interpretation, deciphering, and hermeneutics? Uh, but for the sake of simplicity today, I want to offer two basic rejoinders to this truism, rather than seeking immediately to resolve the problems it introduces. So, my God, is there no more? No, I guess no more seats. Okay. Um, wait a minute. 
Sorry, special colleague. So, back to simplicity. Um, rather than dealing with this truism about whether or not you should believe what you read, I want to offer two rejoinders to it, rather than seeking to resolve it. Sure, don't believe everything you read, that's fine, but here's point number one. Don't disbelieve everything either. More on that in the point coming. But what my book is really about is a kind of second point, point number two, the prospect of not believing everything one reads with. And the width here could be like your lying eyes, or the efficacy of the uh, critical methods um, we've accumulated as readers. There may be a sucker born every minute, as P.T. Barnum once said, but the surest way to become a sucker is to convince oneself that one is not. That's what the other huckster, Jacques Lacan, once said when he wrote in a kind of punning series of jokes, the non duped air. So this is kind of literary criticism 101, forgive me. Outsider theory is a book about ideas that historically have challenged efforts to demarcate their place in modern intellectual history as either true or false, as either good ideas or bad ones. For this reason, the book is also an exercise in method, in scholarly method, since it involves posing the challenge of one's own tools and concepts for reading, evaluating, and thinking through ideas in the first place. I've picked the most, like, oblique and boring way to start this. Um, I'm not giving you like the, the throbbing, beating whistle of the heart tissue of the book itself, but rather what I think its repercussions are. Um, but I'm still going to go back to the history of writing it too. So for me, writing the book involved working through my own susceptibility to a kind of magical thinking when it comes to critical methods, like what we do in the literature department. The fantasy, that is, that there might be a particular set of tools for thinking and reading that could yield definitive results, instrumental, important ideas that come out of it, let's say, whether in terms of political significance or professional capital. Um, again, this, this book is selling like hot cake. <laughs> so I'm clearly catching in on this. Um, on one hand, then, what my work dramatizes the simple methodological point that there is no magical bullet, magic bullet of method, whether shot from the canon of literary critical theory or materializing from a flurry of distant um, claims to be post-critical. That's a little in-joke. This is by making a very simple and not especially clever sounding point for intellectual practice. Critical thinking, um, sorry, the intellectual practice and critical thinking demand that we listen carefully, read a lot, look for empirical evidence, and to be both suspicious of everything we read and naive all at the same time. How is that possible to be super, super suspicious and really, really naive? Such magical thinking of looking for you know, the source of all knowledge or some way to get it all, nonetheless has a long history. And I'm certainly not the first person to wrestle with its Faustian allure. This is why you're here, class, by the way. Um, wouldn't it be glorious to gain the capacity to read everything in the right way? There's no shortage of historical examples of efforts to make this so, from the Philosopher's Stone to Borges' Aleph and innumerable other methods, including the story of Faust. My work for this book thus meant opening up the Pandora's box of thought systems, of theories, that often tried to do everything uh, or to change everything with all the Copernican or apoc apocalyptic resonances of this term. At an even more basic level, I also wanted to study where some of the concepts that I admire came from and, so to speak, what, what happened to them along the way. As a student of surrealism, Hoda, and, I, and again, I want to thank both Hoda and Magali for inviting me here into that beautiful introduction, and forgive my lack of generosity in doing that earlier. But as you mentioned, I, I have this other book on surrealism, and as a student of surrealism, much of the thought and writing I follow already <coughs> warns against the dangerous illusions of imperial certainty, of closure and self-evidence even in the name of changing things. So from a scientific thinker like Gaston Bachelard to contemporary people like Isabel Stenger, Edward Glissant, and Nathaniel Mackey, among so many others, much of the conceptual writing I really admire explores imminent discontinuities within the world systems of language and thought, within a, uh, within a signal there is noise. Within communicative speech there is murmur and stammer, especially in mine. 
Within the physical universe, within history, within the history of ideas, there is void and fold, rupture and discontinuity, overcoding, overcoding and non-discourse. Such terms that kind of recur throughout the history of contemporary thinking disclose the extent to which one's own thinking is subject to a retreat from instrumentality. Even in spite of efforts to the contrary, we stumble over a frustration of ready meaning and even an errantry in its development as a truth procedure. According to this body of work, thinking must instead accommodate itself to the vicissitudes of experience, its conditions of mediation, and even erasure. You can't just simply grab onto like the fact that every murmur, uh, sorry, every uh, signal has noise in it as like suggesting that the world's going to automatically fix itself. These are problems. Stammer, void, discontinuity, error, opacity, even schizophrenia. In humanity scholarship, such terms tend overwhelmingly to refer to the concepts of so-called major thinkers in philosophy and art, rather than the ever-expanding ranks of discarded, unpopular signifiers that often characterize such noise, such stammering, such breaches within the fabric of communicative understanding. It's one thing to, to cite Michel Serre as an authority on communicative interference, on noise, or Gilles Deleuze on schizoanalysis. What does it mean, though, to direct our own critical attentions toward schizophrenic thinkers, or toward interrupted communication? Such asymmetrical entanglements may not necessarily yield the kind of return our, on our investments we might seek in tarrying with the negative elements of intellectual history. It might instead call our thinking out of orbit entirely. But this, and I feel very strongly about this, this is a risk that we must increasingly confront as contemporary intellectuals. And I mean that intellectuals very broadly, cultural workers, students, teachers, librarians, anything like that has to do with knowledge and circulation. This is a risk we must face, regardless of whether the theories we study and deploy are outlandish or not. Excuse me. So, outsider theory presents an open set of thinkers. It's just one, a few in a series of possibilities. Um, of thinkers and works of creative speculation that corresponds with such messy entanglements, stammer and void and so forth. In doing so, my intention is to urge a renewed interrogation of our investment in the security and methodological self-evidence of modern intellectual history, the tools we use, the tools we develop in school, the tools we practice as critics. Um, so, though some chapters of the book treat relatively canonical figures, such as the Marquis de Sade, who's heard of the Marquis de Sade, right, everybody? Um, Marcus Garvey, well-known figure, important figure. The main purpose, though, is to suggest that the corpus of this thing I call outsider theory may be at once endless and, in many cases, anonymous. Now, I'm not going to really describe the concept, the name, outsider theory. Um, you can look at pages, you know, 3 to 36 or whatever to get a full genealogy of this term. Um, I use it as a kind of placeholder um, simply to suggest that what's at stake is some kind of idea of, of inclusion and exclusion of people we, or theories of thinkers and ideas we consider to be valuable or not. I'm going to leave it at that for the time being. The content of the book, though, stretches from the occult fascination with Gnosticism to the cartographic drawings of psychotic asylum patients. The sequence of case studies that I feature in the book make, makes no claim to the encyclopedic or taxonomic. I'm not trying to identify which one's in, which one's out. Even so, I consider it imperative to devote really sustained attention to specific figures and texts in their historical environment. Lest the ideas that I have about like all of these concerns about knowledge be reduced to yet another set of ideas put forward by a critical lineage that looks like every other textual history. So I have to have examples. And I'll get to them in just a minute. Um, so his, intellectual historians and philosophers of science have long been fascinated by the intersections of scientific knowledge and the occult of enlightened reason and mysticism. From the vantage point of the contemporary age today, the permeable boundary between alchemy and science, for instance, pretty much legibly documents the variety, if not the fecundity, of wayward turns along the path of intellectual history. Sir Isaac Newton was an alchemist. We can forgive the pre-Socratic uh, uh, 
mathematician Pythagoras for his weird aversion to beans, right? That would, like, he's a little bit nuts, but, like, it works out, right? He develops Pythagorean theorems. The history of ideas is incomplete, um, Ilya Pirogane and Isabel Stengis contend in 1979, is incomplete without the inclusion of failed, bad, outmoded, or unimportant ideas. As they argue, and Pirogane is a Nobel Prize winning thermodynamic scientist, for unless we unrecognize such efforts as part of our intellectual heritage, we end up inventing arbitrary starting points for the systems of knowledge we claim to study and adapt as our own. It's important to study the dustbin, they argue. Neither intellectuals nor concepts are sui generis uh, inventions. They do not simply, you know, simply show up fully formed from either laboratory experience or from the crania of history's great geniuses. Such triumphalist myths of intellectual progress owe their sovereignty to the habit of relegating um, local, discontinuous, disqualified, illegitimate knowledges to the margins of intellectual history, as Michel Foucault once argued. Note here that I'm actually breaking my own law again, like just naming famous thinkers. Um, the danger of such relegation is less that the public or the popular media or pundits policy wonks and politicians or other things beginning with P have all succumbed to postmodernism and now debate the extent to which expertise is political or to which facts are socially constructed. We hear a lot of that. The danger, rather, is that facts and expertise can be excised altogether from the mechanisms of political decision making. It doesn't fucking matter whether you, your facts are facts. Much political work has been done over the past several decades, from budget cuts and culture wars to dirty wars and disappearances, to purge the public life, to purge the political process of its messy entanglements with the infrastructures of democratic process, the institutions and networks that give voice to intellectuals, scientists, artists, and concerned citizens. This is especially the case when such voices are those of women, indigenous peoples, and people of color. Efforts to marginalize or disenfranchise the production of knowledge can have the effect of reducing the value of intellectual work to political effectiveness alone, or economic gain alone. Like, if it doesn't do this, it's not worth shit. How do we respond to such acts of political marginalization? And by we here, I mean, once again, cultural workers, intellectuals, teachers, scientists, critics, artists, producers of knowledge. The answer is certainly not to, to, to know less, right? Um, to think less. Throughout the book, I stress the importance of expanding, in fact, the set of information about intellectual history and the life of ideas that we might possess. And beyond merely expanding like the personnel of intellectual history, the work that I propose to do includes taking stock of all of the stuff, all the environments around thought that shape it and recirculated, the media, the networks, institutions, and environments within and through which ideas come in contact with each other. And I'm going to suggest that this, is, that this messiness is continuous with, although not reducible to, the messiness of the world, which includes the world of decision-making and administration. Outsider theory proposes that we attend to the ways such environments not only shape ideas, relativism, but also arbitrate between them, which is a political point as well as classifying or enforcing divisions between and among groups of thinkers. In this regard, my work is aligned with other contemporary sociologies of knowledge that acknowledge the radical historicity of the ideas we employ, study, and instrumentalize, as well as the forms and conditions of their deployment, how they come to be vested with ideological specificity, how they come to be known, how they come to be trivialized or written out as well. Radical history, this kind of history of ideas, means recognizing, as Gabriel Rockhell puts it, that everything is historical, including our most privileged practices, cherished concepts, and venerated ideas. Such practices, concepts, and values are part of history, and they participate in history as well. It is not enough to argue about whether or not facts exist, or how they are constructed. The point is to account for the means by which facts and non-facts alike circulate and take on meaning as elements in a historical process. That's, that final statement is kind of like my argument in the book. All right, finally to some examples. Doing okay, everybody? Yeah, good, excellent. Um, so, 
Half of 120? That's on our, on our list here. <laughs> One of my favorite examples of such radical historicity is Ishmael Reed's 1972 novel, Mumbo Jumbo, which we'll be reading um, in Conflict 120 in the coming weeks. Reed's novel, um, published in 1972, an important date, both narrates and, I maintain, participates in an epic war of attrition that would determine whether the ballast of occult and discontinuous knowledges belong belongs to the forces of liberation or to the strongholds of empire and reactionary violence. It's a big mouthful. In Reed's really, I mean, brilliant allegory of the civil rights era, the Jazz Age, the United States of the 1920s, becomes the immediate battlefield for an epic struggle to secure a hermetic power whose origins date from antiquity. Just kind of once a holy grail, a secret book, a book of Toth, and a spontaneous force that just grew. A Nazi reference. Set in a prohibition era, New York scarred by segregation, lynching, and colonial expansion. The background of it is also the U.S. occupation of Haiti. This millennial crusade plays out within the fiction, interdiagetically, as a racial struggle with mortal consequences. But for Reed, the terrain for this war is not limited to the immediate conditions of racism and oppression in the U.S. and its occupied territories, whether in the 1920s or the late 60s when he's writing, or now. But it also extends to the long historical legacy of their perpetuation, from the deep past to the imminent present. That is, the racial struggle, sorry, excuse me, the, the struggle between reason and unreason, or more accurately, the struggle for determining the political force and meaning of knowledge traditions, is nothing less than the epical clash of universal histories. So in Reed, you get these two kind of positions, um, what he calls the wallflower order, which is um, an actual group, an actual conspiracy, uh, like a sect. Um, wallflowers are people who don't dance. Right? Um, so the wallflower order epitomizes the vast ballast of white supremacist narratives of Western civilization that includes the universal history of Emil Gabriel, Max Nordau, Lothrop Stoddard, or even Hegel. Right, this idea that there's a rise in civilizations from the, you know, the backward um, Asia and Africa to the white supremacy of the West. In place of a canon, though, Reed figures this tradition as a zombie-like conspiratorial, conspiratorial sect bent on upholding the privilege and racial purity of Western, so-called Western civilization. And it's a, literally, literally a millennial order that spans the ages from ancient Egypt through the Crusades and into the contemporary. There's actually a character who's like a thousand years old. This wallflower order contrasts starkly with the idiosyncratic set of traditions it seeks to stamp out, which, like the ancient body of Osiris, can be disarticulated, can be torn into pieces, yet nonetheless keeps coming back to life. Among this fragmented body of knowledge are the competing historiographies of ancient African empires that continue to this day to be dismissed by right-wing pundits for their Afrocentric bias, including works by Edgar Wilmot Blyden, J.A. Rogers, Frank Snowden, Marcus Garvey, and more recently, Chick Ante Diop and Martin Bernal. A number of such texts flesh out the bibliography of Mumbo Jumbo, Reed's novel. And yes, it's a novel with a bibliography. This is kind of significant in itself, right? It comes with its own ballast. Yet Mumbo Jumbo also ascribes living agency to such epistemological warfare, this kind of war of competing libraries. It's fictional characters fighting to the death, in many cases, to teach the difference between a healer, a holy man, and a deputy who returns from the grave and causes mischief. It's a quote from the book. In its zombie history of recursive, universalizing theories, Mumbo Jumbo seeks less to enforce the demarcation between good and bad theories than to dramatize the stakes of their intelligibility. I invoke Mumbo Jumbo here, again because we're reading it in class, but also uh, because it's in the book, but especially to signal the political intensity, as well as the long, really long trans-historical reach of many of the so-called unorthodox theories I examine in outsider theory. More than a panegyric to the intrinsic freedom of the heterogeneous and spontaneous, Mumbo Jumbo stages, as I said, the epistemological conflict as an epic political struggle. 
you don't often see people um, fighting over a library. There's a whole book about how that happened in Timbuktu recently. Really just think about you know, who gets to own the history of knowledge. Occult or otherwise discontinuous knowledges are not intrinsically countercultural or politically reactionary in themselves, Reed suggests, as do I. They belong neither to the left nor to the right. Nor, however, is the generation of conceptual outsides and short circuits in truth production a neutral or natural process in the ecology of knowledge either. Rather, as Reed dramatizes in his novel, the determination of those positions, of those meanings, is political. They have been mobilized to serve interests across the political spectrum. You probably read about tales of Hitler's fascination with the occult. These populate the public sphere just as extensively as the New Age movement's reclamation of ancient religions for spiritual uplift, likewise populate the public sphere. Excuse me. Mumbo Jumbo gives names to these warring factions in framing their battle for occult knowledges, spirit, the power of soul, as a transhistorical epic. Um, so I've said a little bit about the wallflower order, and the, the other position, the inverse warring position, um, is called Jess Grew. It's a reference to um, Topsy and uh, Harry Peter Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin of somebody who's um, deprived of access to the story of her own birth and to enslavement, who just mythologizes her existence as having Jess Grew. We first encountered Jess Grew in, in the novel as the outbreak of a dance craze at the novel's opening hitting the news wires like a sort of zombie plague. But as we learn from the novel's protagonist, Papa Laba, Jess Grew describes the spontaneous eruption of a life energy which for some is a disease, a plague, but in fact, he says, it is an anti-plague. So according to Papa Laba, the voice against the wallflower order, right, pro-dance, is that the zombies are not the dancers in the, in the Jess Grew, but the legions of ideological automata mustered by the wallflower order to suppress the dance. Their lockstep accord to white supremacy is epitomized by the Haitian zombie, the duppy who returns from the grave and causes, causes mischief. Reed's novel thus recasts the history of U.S. racial persecution since the Middle Passage. Instead of a violent history haunted by the pre-scientific myths and pseudo-concepts of racial superiority, of whiteness, we find an active millennial struggle for narrative control of these myths, their value and meaning, and the ballast of the cult of sources they bear. So, let's see what I have next here. Do I have a good picture? No, I'll get there. <coughs> My book argues for the urgency of studying how, the means by which, even the most dangerous ideas stick around as zombie concepts, or even in some cases, how they follow a path to legitimacy, whereas other forms of knowledge come to be trivialized or forgotten. Right? It's not just judging why or how, sorry, not just judging that one is worth keeping or worth getting rid of, but how they actually get that way. Precisely because the stakes are so high, we would be remiss to ignore the demand better to understand such patterns and systems of circulation, which tend to become obscured at the very moment we cease to or, or we seek to erase problematic works from our memories and purge them from our grand narratives of intellectual process. We can talk about the stakes, like the consequences of that statement um, in the Q and A. Am I actually arguing that we should be reading creationism in school? Yeah, I am actually, but just not like in place of something else, but actually as the history of ideas. Big, big caveat. <laughs> It is not enough to lament the fallen state of knowledge in a post-truth age. Rather, it's incumbent upon contemporary intellectuals, I argue, to expand rather than restrict their horizons of study in order to consider the dynamic and often convoluted ways in which conceptual schemes form, adapt, persist, and change in meaning. The demarcation of knowledge from non-knowledge, fact from non-fact, reason from unreason, is an act of sovereignty. Acknowledging this idea, this political incumbency both demands and specifies ways to intervene in this process of political meaning making in turn. Um, in her book Black Feminist Thought, uh, many of you know this, Patricia Hill Collins identifies four domains of power as critical sites of tactical participation. So it's, you can repeat after me, right? The structural domain of power that encompasses large-scale social institutions such as the legal institution, the popular media, that reproduce relations of power and reinforce social hierarchies according to segregation by race, gender, 
sexual orientation, language, and immigration status. You have the disciplinary domain of power that encompasses organizations, such as schools, industries, hospitals, and banks that manage power relations through bureaucratic hierarchies and the regulation of expertise. You have the hegemonic domain of power, which comprises the forms and means of, for shaping ideology, culture, and consciousness. And finally, for the interpersonal domain of power that encompasses the routinized day-to-day -day practices of how people treat one another and themselves. These are the domains in which intellectuals, scientists, and cultural workers can and must continually reinsert themselves as participants within the concrete operations of power. On behalf of new creative solidarities and ethical redistributions of knowledge and power. It is for this very reason that asking new questions about who and what we consider to be intellectual or scientific and cultural remains especially urgent. The sociology of knowledge is not limited to description. It both demands and seeks to enable imminent participation in the radical historicity of thought by illuminating its fields of operation, these four domains. And this is ultimately the horizon to which outsider theory aims. Um, now, I'm going to end um, a few, few minutes to go, but I'm going to end this talk as my book ends by invoking the composer, jazz pianist, band leader, mystic, and philosopher, and poet, Sun Ra, um, whose centenary came a few years ago, um, in 2014, um, as an experimental thinker about the frontiers of human knowledge, and especially with this kind of po political struggle for meaning in mind. Sun Ra's literally outlandish self-presentation, he was really fond of invoking outer space in his self-presentation, um, as an intergalactic traveler belies the notion that even the farthest reaches of the cosmos have long been colonized as white, whether in concept or in historical actuality. For example, in the 1980 poem, this is on the bottom left, this is a kind of a mimeographed um, book of poetry that he produced. Um, in the poem, he uh, addresses readers with a proposition that, is, that they've lost their rights to the resources of futurity and imagination on a cosmic scale. I'll read this poem quickly. If I told you I am from outer space, you wouldn't believe a word I said. Would you? Why should you? You've lost your way. You should have nothing to say. You've lost your rights to walk on Jupiter and Mars. And even other worlds unknown among the stars, among the stars. You've lost your rights to the pleasant, to the pleasant thing of being. You've lost your rights, your cosmo-interplanetary intergalactic external rights of celestial being. I invoke Sun Ra here as a thinker for whom the interplanetary, the, what he says, the cosmo-interplanetary intergalactic proposes the literally outlandish potentiality of outer space as a site of a struggle for rights that may remain lost, erased, or crushed. To Patricia Collins' four domains of power, Sun Ra not only suggests um, possibilities for insertion within each of them, but also proposes even a fifth domain, um, a fifth domain of power, the domain of outer space, of speculation, as both a resource for futurity and imagination, and more profoundly still, a realm of political intervention as well. Now, this is not the place to delve fully into Sun Ra's extensive career. I'll spare you that. I'm almost done. Um, but just to be specific here, my aim in invoking Sun Ra's thought from outer space is, in, is to dwell briefly on this fifth speculative domain as the realm of experimental thinking to which my book beckons and to which Sun Ra's cosmic mythos brings to a powerful synthetic attunement. Um, let me see. I'm going to skip to the final um, point here. You've lost your rights, Sun Ra says, to walk on Jupiter and Mars. Naming the condition of segregation and colonial domination um, of mid-century Jim Crow U.S. as a global rather than national situation, he says in an in interview, it's bad wherever you go. <laughs> Sun Ra logically extends cruelty and exploitation as a totalizing human condition. But rather than defining better models of comportment according, let's say, to a restricted economy of moral or socioeconomic values, Sun Ra's teachings counterpropose an explicitly otherworldly set of historical and epistemological coordinates, as well as a 
mass of readings, texts, a whole library, much like Ishmael Reed does in Mumbo Jumbo. <laughs> you read a lot, you listen to a lot, but when you take on some Ra. Forging a continuum between ancient Egypt and outer space, he posits a future alternative to the exploitative futurity implicit in the fallen state of planetary affairs. He calls this altered destiny. This altered destiny demanded an alternative set of attunements. You can't just escape it by going further. It's already bad out there, too. You have to change destiny itself, which means tuning yourself differently. A celestial harmonics engineered according to an inhuman cosmic scale. Um, so another way for Sunrise to approach the problem of governmentality, of race and racism, was to leave this planet behind and enter the space age. This is how people, meaning black people, people of color, and only by then extension of all those in human form, might come to regain the rights lost to cruelty and groundedness, to regain the right to cosmo and interplanetary intergalactic external rights of celestial being. Such a speculative recourse to space resonated with the blistering irony that the Cold War space race coincided with the civil rights movement punctuated by the murders of Emmett Till, Medgar Evers, the four girls killed in the Birmingham church bombings, Addie Mae Collins, Carol Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley, along with Malcolm X, Martin Luther King Jr., and so many others, including Sun Ra's friend, Henry Dumas, the writer and fellow black arts movement collaborator who was gunned down by white police in the New York City subway in May 1968 in a case of so-called mistaken identity. Sun Ra's, Sun Ra's appeal to space was not a fantasy. It was a polemic whose didactic premise was that Sun Ra was from outer space and bore its truth. Um, final bit on this here. It's a great picture of his attire. Um, outer space, as I mentioned, for Sun Ra had already been colonized as white. In a famous scene from the 1974 <coughs> film Space is the Place, Ra materializes shoes first before a group of so-called black youth of planet Earth and offers to bring them back with him to outer space. White people, he notes, are walking there today, having already landed on the moon several years previously. They take frequent trips to the moon, he says. I notice none of you have been invited. Sun Ra's literally outlandish self-presentation as an intergalactic traveler belies the notion that even the farthest reaches of the cosmos have long been colonized as white, whether in concept or in historical accuracy. The race for space was, for Sun Ra, a battle to disrupt the colonization of outsider theory, like the colonization of space, as a white supremacist instrument. It's the same point that Ishmael Reed makes. Sun Ra thus moves the sphere of contestation, of a demand for rights, into the outer reaches of the imaginary. What is alien in this method is its premise, sorry, is its promise, not its premise. We know or think we know that thought does not really come from outer space and that Sun Ra is not really from Saturn. How do we know that? Sun Ra's project rejecting planet Earth as a dead place of abandoning rather than dialecticizing or otherwise engaging the terms of globalization was proleptically to grant a flight that exercises a right rather than a presumption. As Amiri Baraka wrote of Sun Ra, the possible is obvious. What is desired is the impossible. Ra's theory of outsider theory did not propose an impossible revolutionary horizon to be either mustered or mourned. It enacted a synthesis that introduced the impossible as something to engage in actually, as a kind of science of accidentals. And I spare you the whole discussion of that. And just final lines. As Sun Ra teaches us, there may not only be more ideas out there to be thought, more ways to participate in the known domains of power than anthropocentric life admits. There are also other domains we have not yet fully discovered, and new communities of thought that have yet fully to take shape. If this is to be the final act for human life on Earth, as we often dramatized, then the time for reclaiming our rights to the altered destiny within all five domains of power is fully upon us. And that's my final line from the book and then my final line for today. Thank you very much.
floor for questions. We have just a little over 20 minutes. Yes, Rose. Speaking of, um, thank you so much for your talk. I really enjoyed it. And I'm just, there are so many things I could ask, but I just want to focus on one thing, which is how do you really defend or how do you using the term the offer as a kind of a catch bag? Because I tend to work in cultures that have a different sense of what is possible, what is possible, because they're not based on any kind of cut, cut to you here. So when you talk about extra and proper sector, for example, if you're talking about most of the communities and I think you go away from Africa and go to Australia, most of the communities that I live in. Stay where you are. Huh? Just stay where you are, it's okay. Stay where I am, okay. No. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> but even if you talk about if you go to uh, indigenous communities in Southern Australia, uh, in Aboriginal Australia, you're already um, in Thompson. So the, the, the term occult is no less problematic than the term outsider, yeah. and uh, both in the, I mean, the Couplet 120 version of it is in the book, so I've already inherited it, but it's, they're both heuristic devices, and, and I think it's really fundamental in the, the book not to take them as categories that hold a set amount of stuff. The very problematic designations, mm -hmm. precisely for the reasons that you suggest, if they, if, if, you know, who's making them up? Who's actually using that word to describe something that? Yeah, right, exactly. Um, and so I, um, I didn't give that genealogy in this talk because that could be the other 25, 35 minutes. Okay. But I will say that just quickly that uh, what I use the term outsider to do is in what I think in the class the term occult does is it it marks a site of demarcation, a site of kind of re-archiving of certain kinds of knowledge that always have the kind of political stakes that I'm describing here that you mentioned there, but which have to be studied in their specificity, in, the, in their particularization. So precisely because they're so problematic as designations, I think it's important to study the sites in which, the, which, in which they're being used. Now, I use, them as, I use one of them as the title of my book, which books the fact that I'm reproducing it, but tell me that. Okay. Um, but that, that, I mean, I hope that answers your question. That there's, like, there's not like a simple, you know, these are, this, this is the occult, and this is the outside, and this is this. Again, would you say, just one more question then, are, is, does the African, the African-American culture to which you're referring to now hold a specific place in the unwinding of the archive? In the unwinding of the archive. Archive, or archive, archives in the There's a whole lot of stuff, right? That's been that this has happened to, and I think it ha the the trivialization, the demarcation as not. So for as many ideas that are bad that get taken up as tools, I mean, um, I mean, readers of Deleuze will know that, like, you know, Deleuze is all about collecting weirdos, right? Yes. And then making them his own. For every version that there's like something kind of a little bit sketchy, Heidegger, for example, right? Um, kind of sketchy, but informs a lot. For every version of that kind of process of taking something up that might be suspicious, there's plenty of situations in which work has been made more suspicious by its perception as well. And this happens disproportionately to indigenous thought, right? Um, to African American thought, to thought, thought by African American women in particular. I mean, that's all. That kind of marginalization is like the flip side of the co-optation of certain kinds of things as. as as tools, I think. Um, and I think it's important to study both movements as they're happening. So that those are the kinds of one is courted labor and one is not. But anyway, it's they're both, but they're both doing a lot of work. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Um, I guess, what would you say about if all this knowledge is available to everybody, what, there are always going to be people, I would argue, that are not going to be curious to seek, seek out that knowledge. And so they're going to listen to the people who yes. force the yes. knowledge to them. So how would you like deal with, I guess, that circumstance? So it's a terrific question. And in a, in a way, the book, the fact that the book's like 400 and something pages, it's like already kind of a taunt, right? It's, like, it's <laughs> um, to, to tease out that. I mean, I think that that kind of curiosity is not just like a ingrained susceptibility to be interested in stuff. It's actually also, there's a devotion attached to it, right? It's, it's work, much the same as thinking about labor. To be curious is to actually have to like, to burrow, right? To, to dig into stuff and to kind of take on the risks that that entails. And so I appeal exactly to that curiosity. That is exactly what I'm talking about. It's just something a bit more, um, something a bit more militant than just like bright-eyed willingness to, to, to read. Um, and, but the way that you frame it, though, is exactly what I've been dramatizing in this, right? The way in which knowledge dissemination becomes about power has exactly to do with the places where you get told to tell what to do, um, instead of doing it yourself. Now, there's not like a magic bullet either way. Like, I'm doing it all myself. I'm not taking lessons from anybody. Fuck y'all. Yeah. That's, that's equally problematic. <laughs> but it's to recognize that that's what's at stake in curiosity, is, is very much what I'm like, all about. Just to follow up on, on these two questions, there are two moments in the talk that kind of stood out for me, and I just wanted to get clarification. The drinking part? <laughs> well, one was uh, the moment where um, you're talking about noise and signal, and uh, which is one another one of these moments of distinction. And you say, of course, this is a problem, the noise and signal, as opposed to right. what one might expect somebody taking this an outsider standpoint to, to say, which is sometimes we have to listen to the, sometimes the noise is the signal, right? That, that the distinction is useful, but uh, it, it's useful for maybe the ways that we haven't assessed. And then the other moment was this, the neutral, uh, neutral or natural moment. You said, this is not neutral or natural. So is it, it, it seems like this is one of, like the noise and signal one is neither a neutral na or natural statement when you say, no, in fact, there is a signal and we have to sort of um, pay attention. This is really true, and it falls up nicely from both those yeah. questions, actually. Um, the, there's a real temptation, um, and I study this stuff, right? So, like, to like look in the deep archive for the really badass, like, dangerous thing, like, oh, Bataille, the big toe, it takes, like, the gross pictures of big toes, like, or the, you know, look, think, looking at, like, gruesome, dirty pictures from the past, like, it's going to be so subversive, everybody's going to shake. And they're going to be really angry, and you know, it's going to rock the political world by finding this, the thing that, right? By the, so, in other words, taking all those moments of discontinuity, the, the noise, the rupture, the void, the fold, and thinking of them as like doing certain kind of work in themselves, um, I find that to be no less problematic. That's why I keep it as a problem than thinking that like getting rid of that stuff is going to be <laughs> is going to be the way to get. But this is the part where the natural comes in. So yep. is it possible to even get rid of that stuff? The, the, right. the dichotomy right. seems right. to me, in fact, to be natural. That, that is to say, we constantly reproduce it, and, and yes, we should resist it, and yes, we should question it, but it, it's sort of a function of what knowledge is, right? Well, I mean, so this is where the idea of the curiosity of figuring out like, why it's happening as it is happening. I don't want to presume that like, it's all natural, just let it go. But rather, seeing where the forces are being exerted. Right? That's, that's the key. Um, but when, when, when people no, are saying you can't really get out out of it, no, there's no and there's, there's no out. Right, right. Right. There's no out. I mean, like, there's no outside in the sense of like there's a magical realm of like political or so in, that, in that sense, it is natural. <laughs> do, we live in a, do, we live, do we live in a natural world? Well, natural in the sense of we can't get out of it. Right. Natural in the sense of the way it is. That's cause and effect. That's not natural. That's actual. <laughs> okay. Okay. Natural. I guess that's what I mean by okay. that natural. Yeah. Right. Um, Stan, uh, possibly very similar to what was previously being discussed, but you uh, first reference how it's important to kind of look into those lesser thought of ideas and ideals. Uh, then you discussed how, uh, I guess, current political climate, there's a lot of talk about how 
people are using those lesser thought of ideals to sort of cover up what is considered the good facts. So considering the fact that we very rarely have a perfectly factual closed system of what's going on, how exactly do those two ideas contrast? So uh, I'm really not the person to, to give this example well, but I'll give it in a, a ham-fisted way. If you're, if you're in a situation where you end up debating climate change with somebody, you're kind of, you're kind of already lost. Right? Because to study why climate change is made into a debatable issue is to already suggest that like, there's a lot of people, like oil companies and so forth, who have a lot of pressure behind making climate change a debatable object. Right? So um, it's not just like an either or, good or bad version of something. It's actually studying like, what's at stake in the, very f the creation of certain kinds of, of, of sorry, certain kinds of debates about what is good or bad knowledge, right? Um, and so, I don't, I want to, I, I'm often, there's, there's never a point where I can like, not point to something that has already been sus, uh, that's not already been subject to those types of engagements. I can't point to a pure outside, right? Something that's never been, you know, pure, never been debated before. It's always been debated in some fashion. But what's making that debate meaningful significant at a particular time and place is really important to, to think about. Unless you just take it at face value, it's like either or. Yeah. I have a, a bit of a clarifying question, I guess. So I'm kind of confused on this idea of noise. So noise is when you read something, is it like the fabricated, like completely fake things that are still true? Or is it like the outsider theory that maybe one person thinks is not true? Or um, I gotta talk that through. So the idea that I'm gesturing towards in the illustration is this used to be a thing called the radio. Uh, you tune into a radio signal and you listen for the music, right? You kind of want to hear the music of the voice communicating to you, and you want to like get like connected to that to that communicative moment. But the radio is always always full of interference. There's so many things that are getting in the way of the clarity of the signal that make it noise. So it's like to so, sort of think about. What a radio does is not just to communicate, it's also to not communicate, right? Because the signals are bouncing around and, and there's so much other stuff to, to consider beyond simply that kind of privileged moment of like hearing the beautiful voice over the radio. So like, as an example, it's one of many ways in which um, there's a kind of like eye, a critical apparatus that is trying to notice those effects, right? Um, so when you're reading a book, you're not just getting the ideas stuck into your head, you're reading the text on a page, the page may be you know, <coughs> dirty, it may be misprinted, or it may just may have other people's hands on it, and it's taking, taking, becoming aware of the medium through which something travels. And so, for this project, right, I'm, I'm interested in, in the medium in which ideas <coughs> travel. Um, and there's a lot in that, including political, a lot of political intervention, authority, you know. Let me explain to you what this means. Uh, I love the term mansplaining because it names a certain kind of authority that is implicit even in a neutral statement. Like, oh, obviously it's like this. And so it's being aware of the medium uh, and the work that medium does to not only shape, but completely change what was said. And so like, going off of that, like we, you said that it's important to be suspicious and be naive at the same right. time. So then wouldn't some of it, like, identifying this noise and then investigating it further, would that create, like, that deeper sense of understanding to that point that you're trying to get to? Like, why ignore the noise? Like, why is that problematic? Can't that be beneficial? Oh, it, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is the, yeah. you got to, like, think about the noise and the, the, the sound. Yeah. Right? It's both. Um, so the suspicion is like looking for the deep secret. You know, what's, what's really at stake here? Where is it all? You know, what's the hidden message be behind the music? And part of it is also then sitting back and thinking like, oh, it's kind of awesome that like sound travels through the air, and you know, and it can bounce off a tree and off you know my sister's feelings, and and it's being aware of both those dynamics, like what's at stake in communicating the sound of the message, but what's also at stake in sound molecules bouncing off my sister's teeth, All right? So that's an index of like that suspicion and naivete together. <coughs> yeah, um, we've mentioned a bunch of what I was, was going to ask already. Um, the political dimension that, that, that you've got into 
and that people have asked about. And I find interesting this idea of signal or noise or uh, different types of good knowledge, bad knowledge, how that interacts with especially a, a current political climate that has begun to utilize this quite effectively. Yeah. And, and, and this idea of where are the political interfaces that negotiate these, these knowledge right. archives because we have now observed that very often what we would call noise, other people would say, no, no, this is the signal and the rest is the noise, and vice versa. That's right. Yeah. No, that's right. I mean, the, the, those kinds of demarcations yes. happen in specific ways. The marginalization ways. that is actively purported by, by certain agendas, yeah. Yeah. utilizing, I mean, these, these strata of, of, of knowledge and, and organization of, of knowledge archives to a degree where we just stand before that and put your hands in the air and say, you know, how do we act on this? Where does our political action actually find an interface to negotiate? So, so part, of the, part of the issue is there's so many different we people in right. this, that's right? right? So, I mean, I would say in graduate school, that's one situation in which these questions, like where does the political happen in the demarcation of knowledge, from useful knowledge, from non-useful knowledge, or whatever, right? Like, What's the best theories to be using for your work? What method? Like, this is a vexed question, right? What's gonna like, and what's the end point? What's what theory is gonna help you get the best, you know, like <laughs> chainsaw the the, the the trunk of some idea and get the best reading of a book? What one's gonna help you get a job in the profession? What's gonna help you keep a job in the profession? What's gonna help you, you know, make your scholarship change the world? Like, same. Very different orders of question leveraged on some books. That's one situation, however, where you pull the they pull the political thread and a lot comes out, right? Um, the way universities are built, uh, how they function in the larger economy of you know polit political structures of the United States and the world and so forth. And um, that's a little different than a kind of intervention that you might make, you know, in a political organization. Um, um, they're not, I mean, the reason I, I really admire Patricia Hill Collins' domains is that they kind of assuage one as to the idea that it's not just one politic, right? Um, there are politics and there are domains of political intervention, and four is a beautiful, you know, very uh, Heideggerian number. Um, but they suggest that, like, it's not, the, it's not the same political ends or the same political medium all the time. And so rather than just giving a number of different examples, I'll just leave it at that and hope that that answers the question. Well, we have time for one final question. Thank for your I'm wondering if uh, there is a claim about there being an alternative ethics thing that is going on inside and outside of the field. Particularly, I am very interested in the way how you think about because when you go through the two examples of Ishmael Reed and uh, Frank Ra, right. there is a consistent attempt to map some sort of historical ethics, like like there's this epistemological warfare yep. going on. There is kind of a storyline. But I mean, when, when the thing I feel like space is also a very important problematic here, because especially when you go to the Sun Ra example, you say, oh, I come from the outer space. Right. It's kind of like a radicalization of the whole provincialized idea, where I provincialized literally the Earth. Okay. Yeah, right. And, right. and I, was, I was wondering if, 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 if because the, when I, when, I mean, when I'm going through my, uh, going through all these examples in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so for example, historical epic has been a very prominent genre, especially in a lot of hard life stuff. If you look into the manifesto, yeah. the New Zealand shooter, for example, he also has a historical theory and epic about what's going on with his life. Right? So I'm thinking that time is it's already a very colonized uh, modes of knowledge production. And, and I'm seeing that space is coming through what your, your example is. So I'm wondering if, if space or, or like the problem of space is something that you can talk more about. Well, okay, so you mentioned the idea that time, of time already having been colonized. It's a great, it's a great point. And whether you think of space, the capital S, <coughs> Space, comma, outer, space. or with a space, comma, idea, or space, comma, things on a map. The idea that there is some kind of uncharted demand, uh, uncharted territory that remains to be discovered, that is a colonial, I mean, broad strokes, that's a colonial fantasy. 
right? That's the logic by which people go and discover things and then claim them for something else. Your right to think that, like this whole book, which I've given you know, two small examples of and tried to assimilate into a small period of time, um, is actually really pushing back against that notion. Much in the same way that Rose's question was asking about, too. Um, so how do you like how do you do it? Like what are you supposed to do given that everything's already colonial? Well, uh, first thing, there's different kinds of colonization, right? That that different kinds of people have to experience depending on who the colonists, who the colonizers are and where they've been. So like metaphorical colonization is not the same thing as like actual being an actual colony of somewhere else. But broad strokes. Uh, the idea of thinking about what are the moments where colonization, the fact that somebody else has already imposed you know, a, a power grid, right, so under, underlying all that you already do, where are the points at which that articulates itself? I mean, this is not a new idea. This is like a kind of, certain kind of post-colonial and anti-colonial criticism. Right? How, do you, how do you disarticulate the undergirding structures of power? Well, get busy. Right? <laughs> find them, localize them, read a lot, right? think about the site specificity of them all. Um, that's maybe an answer to your question. I, I, I feel like that's kind of the overall problem that I'm looking at. Um, so it's hard to generalize about. Other than to say, like, yeah, it happens in different places. <laughs> I think we're out of time. Thank you, everyone, for coming.